Hi guys, it's Crystal. Welcome back to my channel. Um, for those of you who are new to joining us, welcome and hopefully everybody's having a good week. Um, you might hear some farm equipment outside. I have the windows open because it's such a nice day. Even though it is November, I can't believe this. Um, I'm filming a little bit early this week, uh, so hopefully you guys can see this video on Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and I just want to point out that there's a new subscriber, so hi. Um, this person is from the States and they actually lived in Wineville at one point in time, which is now Mira Loma. And that's where Gordon Stewart Northcott uh, killed, and his mother, <laughs> the, um, the young boys. She says actually, or they say, that the farmhouse is still there where he killed it's still standing and the street is actually named Wineville. I find this absolutely fascinating that this, the house is still standing. I know um, with a lot of places they'll tear, the, tear them down like uh, Bayview Drive, you know, where um, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka murdered um, does not exist. Uh, the house in Cleveland where Ariel Castro, um, Ariel Castro, sorry, kidnapped all those girls is also no longer standing. And I know they changed the place of 10 Rillington uh, Street. And also, um, I believe they demolished 25 Cromwell Street where uh, John Reginald Christie and Fred and Rose West killed respectively. Sorry, I hate having to say respectively after I talk about serial killers, but you guys know what I mean. Um, just for a little bit of information, um, last week I was not feeling that great. You could probably tell from the video I was a little bit more scattered than I should be. Um, so I do want to amend the fact that I said that septic tank Sam uh, was found October 13th. He was found April 13th. It's a date I should remember. It's one of my dad's birthdays, but um, I don't know why I switched it over. Maybe I was still thinking October, but I did. I also have another theory to float forward. Um, about him. Uh, if you'll recall, I said that there were at least four main theories, um, three technically because two of them had to do with revenge. So one was revenge on septic tank Sam due to um, cheating or uh, him doing some inappropriate things to children in town. I said one was racism and I said one could have possibly been a serial killer. Um, I did a little bit of research this week and there was a serial killer in the States. Uh, I believe it was South Carolina. His name is Pee Wee Gaskins. Uh, I had heard of him before, but I didn't do a whole lot of research into him. Uh, and he killed in the 60s and 70s. Uh, he killed at least eight people. He claims somewhere along 110, or he claimed, I'm sorry, he was killed in the electric chair in 1991. Um, and he called 1975 his most killingest year. Now, I don't have any evidence that he was ever in Canada at all during this time or at any point in time, but he was hired out as a hitman on various occasions. Uh, he killed indiscriminately. It didn't matter if it was men, women, or children. He mostly killed, he killed a lot more women. I shouldn't say mostly, but he did kill men and he, boys and also little children. Um, and he was sadistic. He did like to torture. And interestingly enough, one of his victims was found in a septic tank. So do with that what you will. It's just a little bit of information. He called 75, like I said before, his most killingest year. That was his, his word for it, not mine. And if it's possible, he was caught in December of 1975. It's possible maybe septic tank Sam was in the tank for a little bit longer. Uh, I'm just saying possible, not probable, because I know people lived at the farm at that point in time. And like they said, you would probably have to know the area, but it's just an interesting theory to float forth. Um, it also leads in today, into today's video. Today's video is on Eve Trudeau. If you'll remember him, or if you'll remember from last week, I did say that it's possible he could have killed septic tank Sam um, because he, he was killing uh, in the 70s and in the 80s. So it's possible. He actually killed from, I believe they said 73 to 85. So it is possible, um, probably not likely, but who's to say. Um, the reason we're going to talk about Eve Trudeau today is because I actually thought he died in the mid 80s. He did not. And he had a very prolific career. Um, he is one of the original Hell's member or Hell's Angels members in Quebec. But he's also one of the few 
and first Canadians to receive the filthy few patch for killing so many people. Um, uh, before we actually get into Yves Trudeau himself, I guess we kind of have to talk about what it was like to live in La Belle Provence at that point in time. Um, before the 60s, from 1936 until about, I'm going to say 1960, uh, Quebec had been ruled by the Catholic National Union Party or the Catholic Union National Party. Um, so they were very ultra conservative. They dictated the way you dressed, um, no birth control, no divorce, no drugs, anything like that. And that's the main party that was there. Um, now in 1960, the Quebec Liberal Party was actually voted into power and this brought very sweeping reforms to Quebec. Um, drug use, raised incredibly, so did illegitimate birth rates and divorce rates. Um, suddenly people who had never had this type of freedom before were living freely. And um, it probably made for happier people, but I'm not gonna say that it didn't make for a lot more crime. Um, in the 60s especially, a lot of outlaw biker gangs started to form. I'm sure there was some before the 60s, but especially they started to. Um, and it's because of this, at this point in time, Quebec went from one of the most ultra conservative places to live in, in North America, to one of the most liberal places to live in, all in the span of a decade. Um, so this was very new and very wholeheartedly embraced, but also led to, like I said, an increase in various amounts of crimes and outlaw biker gangs. Uh, they said by probably 1968, there were at least 350 biker gangs in Quebec, and these gangs were all fighting for territory. So there was a lot of violence and a lot of viciousness and sadistic acts going on at this point in time. Um, now, a lot of young men joined these gangs because they represented freedom, rebellion, and macho man attitude. What it was like to be a man during the times. So that led to even more violence. In, um, Yves Trudeau was actually born February 4th of 1946. I don't know a lot about his life um, as a child. Not a lot was spoken about it. Uh, his father was said to be abusive though, and he was a very militant man. So he could have been a military man. I know he ran his household mili like military-wise. Militantly? I think that's the proper word to use. He ran his family that way. Um, at the age of 16, Eve actually got a job working in a munitions factory. It would either be a munitions or a demolition factory. It had to do with bomb making and bombs. Um, he only did this because he wanted to learn about bombs. It had nothing else to do with him needing money or wanting to make money or help his family, nothing like that. He just wanted to learn how to do bombs. Um, it said that he was obsessed with violence. He was obsessed with military things. He was obsessed with guns and knives and he was obsessed with bombs. So you have a 16 year old boy that learned a vast amount about bombs in a short time. In 1968, at the age of 22, he joined um, a motorcycle gang called the Popeyes. Now, the Popeyes were violent and they were sadistic, but they were just a number of, of any other biker gangs in the area. Um, the Satan's Choice and the Devil's Disciples. Now, if you guys will remember, Satan's Choice is actually an Ontario based um, group, wanted to start having people patch over. And they were looking in the Quebec area so they could kind of introduce themselves into other parts of Canada. But also at this time, you had the outlaws from Chicago and the Hells Angels from California looking to branch out internationally. Um, so it did take a little while and there was a lot of infighting. Both the Outlaws and the Hells Angels ended up having chapters in, um, in Quebec and they ended up being very big rivals, wanting to destroy each other. There was a lot of rivalry going on at this time. Um, from what I know, um, at least five of the ten Satan's Choice, um, 
chapters actually patched over, which means they like integrated with the Hells Angels. And the Popeyes were integrated in 1977. They became Hells Angels and Eve Trudeau was a founding member of this chapter, the Quebec chapter. It's basically the Montreal chapter, just in case anybody wanted to know that was the headquarters at the time. So the Popeyes became the North End of the North End chapter. That's what they were known as, as part of the Hells Angels. Um, and like I said before, you have gang wars going on, turf wars at this time, about who would control the drug trade, specifically in Montreal. Um, the Irish Canadians controlled the drug trade in Quebec because they controlled the port of Montreal and they were not object to using Yves Trudeau specifically, but the Hells Angels to help them eliminate people. Um, by the time of the amalgamation, Yves Trudeau had already killed four people. Uh, he killed them as a hitman for the Popeyes and usually they were either rival gang members or they could be people within the chapter that needed to be eliminated. It was also during this time that Eve uh, started to get really heavily into drugs as well and and that's what they found was going on. Now there are three rules in the Hells Angels if you can believe it. One of them is no rape which I didn't know because I thought um that sometimes that went on. Um, no injecting drugs. Usually they specifically wanted their members only to use hashish, marijuana, possibly some pills, but nothing harder than that. And absolutely, you could not rip off another chapter. There was um, no, I want to say it in the right terms, um, I guess the best way to say it was you couldn't rip off another chapter. You couldn't rip off any of your own members. No stealing from your own chapter. You could steal from other people. Uh, and those were the basic mandates that they wanted all chapters to follow. Um, and most of them did, except the North End Boys. Um, at this point in time, they had been ruled by a guy named Yves Buteau. And he actually didn't like all of the drug use that was going on in there. But he was basically rolled over let's just say and he was actually assassinated in 1983 um and we'll show you a picture just bear with me for one second guys um i just have to type in my password so this is one of the best pictures of him i could find there's not a whole lot that's him on his bike and this picture right here I just want to bring up because he would be the clean shaven guy um, down on what would be, I think you guys is left just to show you. And there is a reason why I bring this up. Eve Trudeau did not look like a biker. He was only five foot six, about 135 pounds, usually clean shaven. And he didn't have the, the really long hair. If you remember bikers, um, the stereotypical image of them is that they have the long hair, they're big, huge, muscular, tall, usually plump type guys, talk gruffly, scruffy beards, um, bandanas, all that stuff. He didn't represent that. Um, I just, it, this guy is crazy. Um, so they patched over to the Hells Angels in 77. And everything was going swimmingly because they could use Eve Trudeau as a hitman and he wouldn't look like a hitman. Most people would trust him. It has been said that from 73 until about 85, Eve Trudeau killed 43 people. This is why we are talking about him. Um, I know because he's a hitman, some of you might say he's not a serial killer. Um, but the basic definition of serial killer is killed three or more people. Um, a cooling off period in between, sometimes days, weeks, months, and not usually in the same location. Um, so hitting different parts. By location, I mean like the same home um, or usually the same neighborhood. You'll be hitting different parts. It could be in a city, but a city. A mass murderer kills four or more people, usually at the same point in time, usually in the same location. No, care, uh, no cooling off period in between. So the man that was killing in Nova Scotia earlier this year is definitely a mass murderer. He did not stop shooting and the Columbine kids were also mass murderers. Um, so Yves Trudeau is very much a serial killer. Uh, he killed this these people for a variety of reasons. Usually it 
was because it was an order from the chapter. Could have been an order from the Montreal Mafia. A lot of them used Yves Trudeau to get rid of people. Um, the Irish Catholics, so as long as you were not <clears throat> an outlaw, so to speak, if you wanted to hire him on, it seemed like that was kosher and you had to pay him. He, he did kill people for money, although I'm sure he enjoyed killing some people on his own. <clears throat> so in 1985, the Hells Angels started to get pretty upset, if you will, with the North chapter. Um, they were blatantly using drugs whenever they felt like it, uh, whatever kind of drugs they wanted. Yves Trudeau himself would steal from other chapters. Um, they would say, uh, pick up some money that was supposed to go to a chapter and basically just pocket it. Uh, they were using more drugs than they were profiting from. So the really hires up of the Hells Angels wanted to get rid of them. Um, at this point in time, they were run by a guy with the name of Via, V-I-A-U. Um, and he was actually even more lenient than Yves Buteau was. If you'll remember, Yves Buteau was assassinated in 1983. Um, so basically, the guys rode the thin line between following the rules and not following the rules. So the big chapter decided it was time to liquidate. So they got eight of the original founding members of the of the head parts of that chapter to come down to a place called Lennoxville. And it was the Sheerbrook chapter that claimed that they were having a meeting and these guys needed to be in it. And when they came, they shot five of them immediately, uh, wrapped them up in sleeping bags and dumped them in the St. Lawrence River. Um, the other three were allowed to leave as long as they um, integrated with the Montreal chapter. You still had to be part of the chapter. But Yves Trudeau was missing from all this. Now, why, you might ask? Because he was in detox. At around this point in time, he started to think, I've been using a lot of drugs, and I usually know what happens when people start getting messed up all the time. They're dispensable to the Hells Angels. You're not valued. I know they preach brotherhood, but if you no longer have a purpose for them, they're going to get rid of you. So he decided to go to detox and he had been using so many drugs because they say it helps uh, a hitman to process what he's doing. It makes it easier to be able to do a hit. Um, but from what most people have said about Yves Trudeau, or Yves Trudeau, he did not have a conscience, so it didn't really matter to him, but he was using a lot of drugs and he did not want to be liquidated. Now, one of the members from Montreal actually went to the detox center and stripped him of his patch and told him he had to remove his tattoos. He says, you are no longer in here. Of course, he heard the news about what happened in Lennoxville. And uh, this was March 24th, 1985. So he was pretty frightened. He stayed in detox for a little while. And when he got out, he went down to um, the North End chapter's offices, if you will, clubhouse, if you will, sorry, and found that they had stolen $46,000 in cash from him and also his motorcycle. Uh, apparently, the Hells Angels told him that if he completed two more hits, he could get his stuff back, mostly his bike back. So he actually did kill one of his targets and they gave him back his bike, but it was too late for Yves Trudeau. He found out through the grapevine that the Hells Angels had a $50,000 hit out on him. So he decided his best course of action in avoiding the hit was to turn police informant. He is actually the first full patch member of the Hells Angels to turn police informant. He's actually also, if you remember, one of the first Hells Angels in Canada to get the filthy few patch. So the fact that this guy was a killing machine and then turned police informant, not um, because he wanted to help anybody, but basically because he didn't want to die is really interesting. So he did go to the police and as part of the deal, he admitted to the 43 killings that he had done. And when I say killings, he killed in very different manners. Um, 29 of the people he shot, and by shooting, I mean assassinations, because he would shoot them in the head, drive-by shootings, and also just regular shootings. He... He bombed 
10 of them. And by bombing, I mean car bombs usually, but he also had this ingenious plan. Uh, he needed to get rid of one of his um, hits. So somebody, uh, I think it was actually from one of the Hells Angels chapters that was no longer useful. So he designed a TV with a bomb in it and he had the TV, a VCR and a video called Hells Angels Forever delivered to this man. And when the man went to turn on the TV from remote control, Eve Trudeau actually detonated the bomb and he blew this guy up. But he also inadvertently killed a couple other people and blew a big hole into this uh, building. It was an apartment building, so a lot of people were left homeless. Um, that is the other thing with him. Um, he was indiscriminate in the way that if you were in the way, you would die. He also beat three people with a baseball bat, and one was a grandmother. Um, she, her son was a former Hells Angel, and he had a hit out on him. So grandma, the son, and another bystander all have to die. And they were beaten with uh, a baseball bat. And he also strangled one person. Uh, the person he strangled was his last hit for the... Um, for the Hells Angels and he strangled him and shoved him in the trunk of a car and just left the car in like an abandoned area. Um, so he admitted to all of these and there were 43 in total and the police claimed it was manslaughter. Uh, well, I should say the Crown said it was manslaughter and gave him a sentence for manslaughter because they said he didn't actually mean to do these things. Uh, it's a very controversial deal. It's kind of like the Carlo Homoka deal with the devil. Um, basically, he was granted immunity for any of the other crimes he talked about that he was involved in, um, as long as they were they made arrests on these. So a hundred he he told on a hundred people. Um, Eighty of them could have been were proven, and twenty arrests were made of this. So he told about a hundred crimes. Sorry, I should say he told about 100 different crimes, 80 people were implicated, 20 people were arrested because of this. So the police really did favor Eve Trudeau. He didn't lie. So they set him up in jail and he was only sentenced for what would basically be life in prison. So, okay, in Canada, life in prison is 25 years, but he was eligible for parole after seven. And if you'll remember, this was 1985, it was 86 that he was tried. So, of course, he served his time. But when he served his time, for four years, the police gave him $40,000 a year. It was put in a trust fund. And he was also given a, a $35 allowance for cigarettes a week, I guess. Uh, his cell was cushy, he could watch TV, um, uh, he would be put in an area that wasn't so terrible, I guess. But I mean, I'm sure he had respect from, from some people in the prison, though not total because he was a rat. And he was kept away from, obviously, some of the people that would seek to do him harm because he was valuable to the police. Um, and he served his time. He was let out in 1994. So would I say he served his time for the murder of 43 people? No, but in the eyes of the police, he did. Uh, Eve Trudeau laid low for a little while from there. And because he was an informant, he was given a brand new identity. And his identity was Denis Cote, or Dennis Cote, if you guys um, want to say it that way. And he lived his life. Um, there are reports that he worked as an orderly in a nursing home during this time. I've also heard other reports that he did odd jobs and possibly drove a bus at this time. I think the one about him being an orderly proved true um, from the span of time. And he was apparently fired from his job in the year 2000. And it was during this time that he started using cocaine heavily again. He had been clean for a big amount of time, but his life was spiraling out of control and he was also starting to molest a boy. He actually molested this boy, actually sexually assaulted this boy from the year 2000 to 2004 when he was caught, um, thus being sent back to prison. He actually represented himself and tried to argue that he should only have two years for this. Um, he only served basically eight to nine years for his 43 murders. So he figured, oh, I should only get two years for basically stripping this kid of his innocence. He was a 14 year old boy. And um, 
The courts didn't agree with him this time. They sentenced him to four years. Um, he was kept in segregation because he's obviously a child molester, so various death threats were on him. Uh, and he was kept in solitary for 23 of 24 hours a day. Um, Yves Trudeau, in 2006, had to complete um, a sex offender uh, program and he did complete it but it was around during this time that they found out he had terminal bone marrow cancer and he was going to die. Um, they did actually parole him so to speak in 2008 because they knew he didn't have much time left so he's not going to be any danger to society. He was not allowed to have contact with minors and no contact with his victim but they knew it wasn't very long that he had left and he actually died in July of 2008. Um, this guy is an unbelievable guy. There's not a whole lot known about his personal life, but he definitely has a lot known about his career. And to me, he's a very prolific serial killer. Um, he not only worked out of Montreal, he also worked out of the Laval region because at one point in time, um, his chapter headed over there. And the turf wars also were interesting to read about. The fact that the outlaws and also uh, the angels were fighting so bad. And actually at one point in time, I think it was in 1979, he killed at least 23 members of the outlaws um, just because they had to die. It was a turf war. Um, things have calmed down a lot in Quebec obviously, but during the 60s, it was definitely called 60s and 70s. It was actually called the Red Zone. Quebec was known as the Red Zone for biker violence. So it does have a very storied history, but that, my friends, is the history of one of the founding members of the Hells Angels for, the, for Quebec, one of the first members to have the filthy few patch for killing so many people, and the first Canadian Hells Angel, first Canadian, first Hells Angel to turn police informant. He's a very interesting guy. So if you guys want to read up more on him, feel free to. Um, don't forget to like my videos, subscribe, notify, and also share. Um, please hit the like button, guys, so that I know how you guys feel. Leave me comments. Um, I would love it. Subscribe. Uh, I'd love to hear from everybody. And hopefully you guys will have a safe week. Um, please remember when you are leaving comments not to leave anything hateful or derogatory towards people. There's enough hate in the world. So let's just try to get along. Um, and hopefully you guys have a good week and I'll see you next week. Thanks guys. Bye.